as we grasp at victory, there is a cancer, an evil tumor, growing. In principle, the war effort is always planned to keep society on the brink of starvation. Little knowledge is a dangerous thing. You read a few lines, you're ready to blow up the world, chop heads off, destroy authority. Revolutions are never bloodless. This brief reign of terror will purge the land of all corruption. This Congress refuses to grant any of my proposals on independence, even so much as the courtesy of open debate. Good God, what in hell are you waiting for? Good afternoon, I'm Michael Malice, and let that be your welcome for the next hour. I am very jazzed for our first show here on Gas Digital. One of the questions I've always been asked about politics and political theory is what is your stance on intellectual property, things like trademarks, copyrights, so on and so forth. And I never answer those questions because I have no idea about it. Uh, and being an author, I clearly have a vested interest in the subject. And just because I have a vested interest doesn't mean I have the correct interest. You know, just like real estate people might have a vested interest in uh, having the government control their rents, doesn't mean they're on the right side of morality. So I ha- brought here as my guest Stefan Kinsella, who is the world's preeminent political philosopher when it comes to anti-intellectual property, which means abolishing trademarks, abolishing copyrights, abolishing, is there a third one? Uh, Yeah, trade secret and patent. Yes, so you think none of these things, you're a fellow anarchist, you think none of these things should be protected by law. Of course, whenever people hear about this, they think it's absolutely bonkers and makes no sense because we've all been taught that piracy is stealing. Yes. Uh, And that certainly is where my gut is leading. So what's the elevator pitch for abolishing intellectual property? Well, I have a vested interest in it, too, because I'm a patent attorney. And so if we abolished it, I wouldn't have a job, although we'd probably have a phase-out period. I'd have a lot of work for 20 years cleaning up all the transitional issues. Uh, The elevator pitch idea is that property rights or control over scarce resources – uh, there are property rights that allow us to decide who uses things that we could have conflict over. So they're conflict avoidance mechanisms. And when the state – Meaning is, like if someone has – their house is their property, their car, or their dog. Their horse, yeah. Yeah. Um, and so the property right says who can own this thing that people could have a fight over otherwise. If we don't want to have fights over it, we, don't want, we want to have property rules. So that's what property rules are for. There are four – Uh, They're a response to the fact of scarcity in the world. And patent and copyright, which are the two big big ones that are bad, basically come in and say that um, someone can't compete with you. They can't copy your book. And what that means is um, uh, the copyright law prevents you from using your own property the way you see fit, right? And patent law prevents you from using your own factory as you see fit. So it basically gives a control to someone else. It creates scarcity where there is none. Um, Information is what IP tries to protect, patent and copyright law. Information is not a scarce resource, so any number of people can use the same idea at the same time without conflict. So you don't need conflict avoidance rules. So when you try to establish these rules, you necessarily cause conflict. Well, but I I mean here, let's let's see how it applies to my own life personally. Mm -hmm. I spent eight months writing Dear Reader, right, my North Korea book. A lot of hard work. You're not going to deny that. Just because I work hard at something doesn't mean I have some kind of right to it necessarily. Correct. Because you could work hard and, and be wasteful and, and be pointless. Correct. I'm sure you're not going to deny I've produced something that is of value. Obviously, people are buying it, so there's Correct. a value of it. The point is, so you're saying that I write my book, I put it out, and the next second anyone can take it and copy it, and I'm not going to see a cent for it. Well, first of all, that can happen now, right? Because we have digital technology. People can copy your book right now without your permission. Uh, sure, but it, it, I mean it's easy to shoot them down. He's, it kind of easy. I mean, there's a whole, you know, there, there's the torrents. There's all over the web. There's it's easy. Right, but to those find. are those are closed very frequently by governments. They are, but people can get around it, and they're going to increasingly be able to get around it. Sure, um, I but, think, I, but hold on. Just because someone is, uh, 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 I know I'm begging the question here. Just because it's easy to steal something doesn't mean right. it's not stealing. So yeah, that's so, not that's not relevant. So you you use the word they can take it. Now the word take usually refers to a physical thing. Like if someone takes my glasses, I don't have them anymore. Sure. Right. Um, and the reason I don't want you to take my glasses. Is it because then I wouldn't have them? I wouldn't be able to use them. If you could like reach out and just touch my glasses and have a copy in your hands, it wouldn't really bother me. Okay. And that's what it's like. But the- your glasses aren't really unique, right? They're fungible. There's other glasses that are like that ever in the world. Right. My book is, or anyone's book, is unique. It's a product of someone's creative expression. 
It is unique, but you see people keep changing the standards for why you should have a, co a copyright or a patent. First, it's uh, I had to put my labor into it, sure. and when you shoot that down by saying, well, you don't really own your labor. Even in physics, if you push against a wall, you're not performing work because you're not moving a mass through a distance, right? Sure. You're just you're doing nothing. And if you waste your effort on something that uh, is a product no one wants to buy, you've, you've expended labor, but you sure. haven't created any wealth. Sure. And by the same token, if you do create wealth by making a product that people want to buy, you've made the world better off, you've made yourself better off. That doesn't necessarily mean you have a property right in the right to receive a stream of income sure. from your customers. You don't ha you don't own your customers. People say that, you know, a new pizza restaurant moves in next door to mine and starts stealing my customers. It's not really stealing, but they misuse this metaphor. So when you said they take your idea, they're they're not taking your idea. They're copying your book. Let's say so. Right. You still have your book. You still have the right to sell your book. Um, so they didn't take anything that you own. Now and then the response would be. Well, they took the profits I could have made. So then you get to the point, well, do you own future potential profits? Because profits is just the money you could have made from potential future customers. But who owns that money? Your potential future customers. You don't own that money. Sure, but l let's talk in terms – I mean there, there's a lot of uh, – of things that are kind of triggering my mind along the way. The, the most obvious one where it doesn't apply just to me is what would be the consequences market-wise if this were put into place because there'd be very little incentive for someone to write a book. Well, and we, we can talk about that, but you got to realize then now you switch to another thing about incentives. Sure. And so people think that the purpose of property rights and the purpose of law is to provide the incentives. And of course, that leads to all these special interest laws that we have where we say, well, we need to tweak this tax this way or we need to have this subsidy here to incentivize or disincentivize the following. Now, libertarians believe the purpose of property rights and the purpose of law is to do justice, to protect people's rights. It's not to incentivize the right things. I don't think that's universally the libertarian perspective on rights at all. It, it's my libertarian perspective, but okay. I think it's the Rothbardian perspective. Okay. I think it's the solid anarcho-capitalist propertarian perspective. But you just said it was about to resolve disputes, and now you're saying it's to provide justice. Those yes. are separate things. Yeah, I think it, it is. I think uh, libertarianism is compatible with consequentialism. That is, you look at the consequences and the reasons for these rules. Sure. But it doesn't mean it's to provide Incentives. I do think the incentives flow from that in a natural sense, but uh, when you're when you sell look when you're selling a good on the market or a service, you have to think how can I make a profit on this good? Because we know from economics, profit is in a way unnatural, right? Because profit is a deviation from the natural rate of interest, and as soon as you make a profit, you're going to send a signal through the price system and through your activities to the market, and you're going to tell people, hey, this guy is doing something that satisfies consumer welfare, so come in and compete with him, right? So profit is always being pushed down by competition. Right. So profit is an unnatural thing. So you always have to think, how can I make a profit? And once I make it, how am I going to keep making a profit knowing that I'm going to attract competitors? Now, that's the case for any line, any line of business, right? Like what you're doing here or a pizza restaurant or a steel factory or whatever. There are certain types of industries and activities where the concern might be it's easier for someone to compete with me because what I'm selling is just a book copy. And it's easy to copy that. Or it's like a new tweak to an iPhone design, which sure. is a patentable invention, and my competitor can just easily copy that. That's the, that's the idea that it's easy to do all this. Of course, it's not that easy. I can get to it in a second. But people think it's just too easy to compete. So the, the calculus you go through as an entrepreneur is, well, if I want to spend time writing a novel, when I start selling the novel, someone can just knock me off right away. It's too easy to compete with me. Right. And therefore, we need the government to come in and raise the barriers to competition by having monopoly privilege laws, which is what copyright and patent do. So you have libertarians who are in favor of the property rights system. Because they see, but see the using the word monopoly a little unfairly because every – like for example, if I'm selling my home, I have a monopoly on my home, right? But that word monopoly has a negative connotation, especially in a libertarian context. So Correct. I think that's kind of uh, not really using that term in, in, a, in a fair way. You could argue that – I mean of course monopoly just means uh, you, you, you have, a, you have a, mon a legally privileged monopoly over a certain industry where you can charge above market right. prices, right? Um, which, is, which is exactly the argument for copyright is that you can sell your book for a higher price than you could if you had everyone competing with you. Sure. You could sell your iPhone for a higher price than if everyone could copy your design right away. So, but if you, the reason I don't think it's unfair is if you look uh, back in. Um, um, First of all, the patent system we have now originated in the 1623 English Act called the, the, the Statute of Monopolies. Okay. So uh, these were monopoly uh, – this arose from the practice of the king granting monopoly privileges to people. Uh, I'm going to give you the right to sell sheepskin in this town. That's okay, it. sure. That has nothing to do with innovation. But on occasion, they would give someone one of these 
patent. Patent means open. So it was an open grant to everyone in the world saying no one can do this except for this guy, right? Uh, pirates had that. Sir Francis Drake had that. They had the right to uh, be the only ones who could do various things, and sometimes it would be an inventor. When this practice got out of hand, the parliament limited it with the statute of monopoly of 1623, and they, they, they limited it only to inventions. So it came out of the, the word uh, – the word monopoly was used by the people who promoted it in the beginning. Thomas Jefferson uh, – so the U.S. Constitution in 1789 had a, has a, a provision which allows uh, the Congress to pass patent and copyright law. Okay, Jefferson was re corresponding with Madison during the drafting of the Bill of Rights in 1790 or so. And he wrote he, – he, he proposed an article, and it would have been one of the Bill of Rights, uh, saying that uh, the monopolies that Congress can grant for patent and copyright should be limited to X years. And uh, it was ignored. It wasn't done. I wish it had been done because otherwise uh, you know, copyright was around 14 years in the beginning, right, right. Um, and now it's a over 100. Right. Uh, uh, but the point is even Jefferson was using the word monopoly in the beginning. Um, but again, but, the word you're, you're. I feel you're using a word that has a negative connotation that did not have a negative connotation at the time. Oh, I think monopolies did have a negative connotation. So, so what happened was um, the the free market economists in the 1800s started getting alarmed at this fairly new institutionalized practice of granting patents, like in the U.S. and then then in, in Europe, uh, which was really institutionalized in the around the time of the Constitution in America. Um, and so they started having an uprising against this practice of granting monopoly privileges, they called sure. it. And so the response to the entrenched in, by the entrenched interests at the time, they started saying, it's not a monopoly privilege. It's a uh, – what do you call it? It's a, it's a property right. And they said, well, it doesn't look like a property right. They said, well, it's, a, it's an intellectual property right because it comes from your brain. So the term intellectual property was an invention of the people, the entrenched interest defending this – what had been called the monopoly privilege grant before. So it's a euphemism. It is. It's, it's definitely – yeah. So – and you even have some IP advocates, some libertarians even, a lot of objectivists like Adam Mossoff and Richard Epstein. You know, They'll say things like, it's, it's a natural right. It's like, well, why does it expire in X years? Right, right. Um, you know, uh, why does it have to be a creature of legislation? Because these things would not exist without legislation, unlike other natural property rights we have, which are the. That's not necessarily true, because if you had some kind of anarchist system, you would very easily be able to have a covenant where no one's allowed to do this within the community. You could argue that, but I would argue that's just a contract in that case. Sure. It's not, it's not a general. I mean, we, it's it's a little bit into the the, uh, the legal weeds, but in, in the law we have the term uh, in rem and in personam, right? In rem is in, uh, a real right, a right in property that's good against the world. So you own your car or your house against someone even in France, just because, even though it's protected by the New York sure. legal system or the American legal system. Um, but if you own a, a right to a property right uh, – I'm sorry, a patent or a copyright, it's only protected within that jurisdiction. Someone could be doing the same invention or copying your book in another country without you even knowing it, and they're not violating your property rights okay. at all. They're not infringing on it at all. You don't even know they're doing it. But this is – I don't understand because I thought one of the big issues in the news is that China violates our IP all the time and the government is livid about it. Technically, that's, that's legally incorrect. They don't violate our – well, okay, so there's two aspects to it. Um, there are treaties that China is party to, and they don't – enforce them 100 percent. Of course, neither do we. We, sure. don't, we don't stop all infringement. China is a little bit more lax about allowing counterfeiting to go on. So in that sense, they're allowing, uh, they're allowing some of their citizens to violate copyright, which is Chinese copyright law, which is in compliance with these federal treaties like the Berne Convention. But I think what Trump is talking about is, is cases that are not covered by Chinese law. So they're just saying that they're copying American ideas, which in the free market we call competition or learning from each other. Well, okay, so these uh, patents slash monopolies came out of what's uh, the Britain and the U.S., right? Yeah, and Europe, Europe had aversions too. But, but what, what I'm saying is these were actually the same places where innovation reached its peak. Correct. So wouldn't this I, – I, obviously correlation is not causation, but certainly you can't say it was uh, on its face harmful to innovation. Well, there's uh, – uh, uh, well, that's another argument that advocates use. They'll say, they'll say that, well, look at the rise of the West and that we have the copyright and patent law. And so they're making the correlation causation mistake because you could make any number of claims. You could say imperialism or, or trade barriers or tariffs or causes too because we've had all those. We, or you could – a war every 10 years is what causes wealth. Um, but um, uh, here's the way I look at it. Congress in 1789 puts in the copyright and patent clause because we had this traditional sort of growing use of copyright and patent from the British system. 
they gave Congress the power to do it because they figured we might need to do it. Um, they said it was to encourage the promotion of creative works, right? So it would have a specifically utilitarian motive in mind, right? Um, now, in the 200, but they didn't have any studies. There was no empirical studies showing that it really would do this. We've had 200 plus years since then to prove it. And time and time again, over the last, say, seven or so decades, uh, Congress has commissioned a study. Fritz Macklup, some great economist, they'll come in and do a study. They can never show that it encourages or incentivizes, let's, let's take the case of patents, that it incentivizes innovation. Uh, almost every study you see, they throw their hands up. They say, we can't figure it out because the numbers are just – it's too hard to prove. Or they'll say, it looks to us like it's a drag on innovation because um, there's all these barriers to small companies making a new smartphone or something like that. Or the big companies acquire all the patents. But I, I don't understand how if I'm a drug company – I'm sure this is a question you get yeah. all the time. If I'm a drug company and it, obviously creating a new drug is a huge, tedious process and right. very laborious, very technical, the idea that I'm putting in seven years of work with yes. these very expensive scientists and all this experimenting and then on day two you come along and you you know duplicate yeah. that drug right why would i bother to create it to begin with right and there's a lot of answers to that but you have to first step back and the fundamental way to look at it i think is is the function of the government to make sure that some dreamt up possible industry or product can be can be successfully made is it the job of government to lower the costs of competition that someone might face Right? Because even if the government comes in and starts subsidizing the pharmaceutical companies, there's still going to be some other drugs on the margin that is still not profit. I mean, it might take a trillion dollars to find some new drug, but, okay. but they're not going to make that one. Even today, they're not going to make some drugs. So there's always some drugs on the margin. Um, so the, and, and the other thing, to, if you look historically, uh, a lot of European countries, which have, were the leaders in pharmaceutical, like Italy and Switzerland, didn't have patents at all in pharmaceuticals for like over 50 or 100 years, and they were still some of the leaders in these areas. So there's empirical evidence. But so showing. how do those companies make money? They sell the drugs. But I mean, like, why would I buy company buy from you at uh, the rate you're the you invent you discover this drug? Right. Uh, I'm going to undercut you at you know whatever the next day. Why wouldn't I? I mean, it just seems like the profits well, are going to margins are going to be much much lower. Let right? me give a little example. Okay. Have you ever seen in a drugstore you have Tylenol right. sitting next to Bargain Brand, of course, uh, CVS Acetaminophen, right? And there it's about five dollars versus two dollars, right? right? What, but Tylenol is still on the shelf. Some people are obviously still buying it. Right. Why would people pay twice as much for Tylenol as opposed to CVS? It's the brand name. Okay, so that's part of it. Sure. So people will pay more for brand name and reputation. So that's part of it. So the idea that just because someone can copy your formula right away doesn't mean that you're instantly going to have equal competition. The other thing is you have to realize that we have this FDA process in the U.S., which slows down the rate of innovation greatly adds to the cost. So one reason it costs so much money and takes so long to produce and sell a pharmaceutical is because of the FDA process. So the federal government comes in, imposes a regulatory scheme, um, which slows down the development of drugs, hampers them. Plus, these companies are taxed out the wazoo, you know, employment taxes, and uh, the, there, there's, uh, there's inflation, there's, there's, uh, there's tariffs, the minimum wage. They are... These are the things that if you got these things out of the way would reduce their cost. But so the federal government comes in and hampers the pharmaceutical innovators. And then to make up for that, it gives them a patent monopoly so they can maybe make some of it back. But So it's like they shackle them on one hand and they put them a helium balloon in the other and it's like it's supposed to balance out. And not only that, as part of the FDA process, during this examination process, which takes, I don't know, seven or eight years, a long time. These companies have to reveal their secrets, like they're, they're made public right. documents. So by the time they finally get their approval, let's say it's five years later, all their competitors, they, they, they've been knowing for five years what the formula was going to be. So they, they're the, ready. Uh, speaking of formulas, let me inter just finish your thought, then we're going to get to it. Well, quick. they're ready to compete right away, whereas if you could keep it more secret and there wasn't a federal government regulatory agency, you would have a longer natural sort of monopoly to sell your product before I see people what you're could saying. compete. So th there's something parallel here with which people might not know about, which is kosher food. So the FDA is what 
guarantees that the food you're eating or, or drugs is safe, right? However, under Jewish law, the food has to be held to a much higher standard. Yes. It's a biblical standard. And if you look at a jar of food, it's going to have a, it's going to have a small K yeah. or a small U, which means this has been certified by a rabbi. So it, it, if you did not have the FDA for drugs, you would still have these certifying companies, Absolutely. which would hold the drug companies to a higher standard. Absolutely. And at the same time, they would allow those drug companies to keep their uh, formula secret so that you would not be able to compete. Because then if you want to you know, deconstruct that drug, that's still going to have a huge startup cost anyway. So effectively, it will keep the cost high enough that they would make a profit under this model, correct? Uh, absolutely. And uh, look, the pharmaceutical case is the one everyone turns to because they think it's the easiest case. Actually, I, we can't go into here, but if you look at Chapter 9 of Boldrin and Levine's book Against Intellectual Monopoly, it's an empirical attack on all the arguments for IP, um, and it's online at againstmonopoly.org. They just go through systematically all the uh, all the myths about why we need I patent, and they went into this as economists, assuming they were going to show why patent and copyright work, and they they came up with empirical studies showing it just it just it, all the all the myths around it, um, all the arguments around it are, are just are just wrong. Um, so so that's that's one argument. But my point is, if even if you believe that we do need patents for the pharmaceutical industry, let's have it for the pharmaceutical industry. But right now we have it for software, we have it for uh, mouse traps, we have it for uh, the, the way your iPhone curves around the outside corners. Um, we have it for so many things, which is trivial. And then you have the you have the patent trolls arise. Um, look, you you also have uh, perverse things like. Um, uh, do you remember the anthrax scare about? 12, 15 years ago. When yes, people, sir. Um, and there's a drug called Cipro, right, which is one of the, um, um, the, the cures for this. And there was only one company that had the U.S. patent on that and the U.S. F and the FDA fe uh, re regulatory approval for that. And they, they didn't have enough to go around. And so uh, because they didn't anticipate this great need for it and no one else could come in and compete and make it because of the patent and the and the FDA system. And so at the time, the... the, um, the uh, I think it's the Commerce Department, whichever department has control over this, FTC, I believe, threatened to do what the federal government has the right to do, which is to grant a compulsory license. Because technically these What's are, a compulsory license? So, so technically patents are grants by the federal government, and the government can take them away because they grant them. It's just a monopoly privilege, which the Supreme Court just recognized, by the way, about two weeks ago in a very important case called Oil States, which is driving the um, – uh, the, the pro-IP libertarians bonkers because it admitted that these are not property rights. These are just federal grants of privilege. Okay. Um, and I was glad to see the Supreme Court recognize that. Um, Do you remember the vote? Was it five four nine uh, nine zero? I think it was higher than that. It was okay. like six three. Okay. So it was it was it was it was really good. Um, in any case, um, um, a compulsory license is the federal government has the right to to grant a license to some third party to to make the product under that patent uh, without them having to get a permission from the patent holder. The government can grant it okay. instead. Now, they have a statutory scheme where they, then they'll pay a fair market. It's like, it's like takings law. You're supposed to give fair market value. So they'll make the guy pay a royalty back to the patent holder, okay. but they can't stop it. Okay. Um, so they threaten to do that. They threaten to do that several times. And of course, all the libertarians are like, oh, the government's threatening to take away your property rights. It, it's like when Social Security holders say, keep your cotton picking hands off my Social Security payments. It's like, wait a minute. That's coming from the federal government. That's a welfare payment. Right. right? Yeah, yeah, you earn back your Social Security in like, what, 20 months or something crazy? Yeah. And then anything after that is just absolutely money that is not you had not paid into the yeah, system. I don't know that number, but it it's, it's something plausible. very small. It sounds plausible. Um, so speaking of the formula, there was a moment where you had an interview with Robert Wenzel. Uh, which we're going to play after <laughs> right now, where this – let's play the clip. Well, let's, let's, let's start with the, the formula itself. I, I have a formula. I'm aware of it. What, it you know, well, actually, you don't have a formula. You know – let's be specific, precise. You, don't, you know a formula, right? You are aware of a formula. It's in your head. I'm not aware of the formula. I know the formula. Yeah, you know it, but you don't have it. You know it. It's knowledge. I certainly do have it. Where do, is it? Do, Does it have a location? Really? Is is, is knowledge but, a lo locatable? Well, hold it, hold it. Does, is is location necessary for scarcity? I no, have the so formula. And nobody else has it. Have it. What do you mean by you what? have it? I'm asking. I you have where? it in my brain. I have the knowledge. Where? In my brain. I thought it was on the paper. I I put it there also, but that's just two. Well, that's now another place. Places. The same information is in two places. Yeah. Well, that's amazing. Maybe we could put it in a million places. Yeah, but it's not there now. So is it scarce or not when it's just in two places? No, information is not scarce. 
So who else has it besides me then, if it's not scarce? You don't have it. You know it. Stefan, are you telling me the whole word? Who, who, well, else can, who, who else can use it, function? Look it. Who, who in the world besides me can act on that if I'm the only one that, that has that formula? No one. Only you. So is it scarce or not scarce? Is it, uh, is it just, super abundant uh, everywhere? Time? It's not scarce. It's not a scarce resource. It's not a scarce means of action. It's not scarce? Who else has it, Stefan? No one has it. What? No one has it. Right. So it's scarce, isn't it? No. It's not? No. What's the formula, Stefan? So what was going through your head when he's just yelling at you that he's got you by the balls, and what's the formula? I mean, over time, I've learned to handle interviews and, and debates by different ways, right? And that was one of two or three I did that was – it kind of got out of hand. It was crazy, but it was so crazy it was almost funny. This was my, a, my friend Jesse said – described it as you were trolling yourself. I guess. I mean, some people some people thought it was hilarious. Some people thought it was an embarrassment. Some uh, it, The reactions to it have been bizarre, but – he was a guy that you would think was a fellow traveler because he's sort of a Rothbardian, Mazesian, libertarian. But he started going bonkers when Jeff Tucker and I, then at the Mises Institute, were, were, were kept attacking intellectual property. And he, you know, he, he, he was he was a started going after us. And so he decided to have a debate. And um, yeah, he brings up some point about he's got a formula for uh, making money off of Google ads or something like that. And he said, tell me what the formula is. And I said, I don't know what the formula is. He said, so, aha, <laughs> patents are valid. I'm like, what? Wait, because let's go back to, like, the, the, for me personally. If you're saying, are you, do you think it's, uh, since libertarians regard monopoly as immoral, right, and using the government to, to get special privileges is immoral, right, is it immoral for me to get profits from Kindle sales in my book? Absolutely not. Okay. Let me, look, let me, let me, uh, um, I didn't expect such a hostile interview. So hostile? <laughs> no, I'm joking. I'm joking. <laughs> the dog goes to eleven. You are welcome. Um, no, so here's the, let me give let me give one example that might explain this. Um, um, imagine that there's no copyright, okay? Okay. And, and you're J.K. Rowling, right? The the author of Harry Potter, and she was just some welfare mom writing her novels on the subway every day, sure. something like that, in, in London, and so. She finally writes Harry Potter number one. And so what would she do? She might not have a publisher. So she publishes it for 99 cents on Kindle. And all of a sudden, she's got a million, 10 million fans around the world. She's like, oh, this is a runaway hit. And she's got, we know she had six other books in her head, right? So let's say she writes book number two, but she says, she writes a note to her fans I've got another book ready to go. As soon as I get $5 subscription commitments from everyone, um, Which is kind of what I did with the Kickstarter for yeah, my book. Exactly, and that that's emerged too. Kickstarter and things like that have, have, have emerged. Uh, she goes, "I'll release it, and you know, I'll give you some swag or whatever." So she does that. Ten million people give her five bucks. She's got fifty million bucks. I mean, that's not little money. Then now, in a world without copyright, and then she could do that seven more times, right? So we're talking. She's half a, half a billionaire already. Just right. j even with people knocking her book off. Um, and then let's say someone wants to make a movie. Well, three companies can start making a movie in the same year on the same book. They don't need anyone's permission. But one of them says, hey, I know if we can get J.K. Rowling to be a, a consultant and say she endorses as this one as the official one, we'll get more of her fans come see the movie. So we'll give her 10% of the profits, right? And so she can make money that way. So let, let me build on this because one of the things that is clearly uh, government at its worst is character law, which is like Superman was invented in like 1935 by Simon and Schuster. Yep. DC Comics, I think, has the copyright. And the copyright was supposed to expire after, what is it, like 75 years after yes. the characters created. And these characters, this, when these laws were written, you didn't have pop culture. Now you have these huge corporations who have a lot of money invested in Superman, Spider-Man, Batman, so on and so forth. And they lobby Congress. And every year, Congress extends this over and over. Mickey Mouse should have been yeah. a long time ago, a copyright yeah. law. And and the point, similar to what you were just making, if these characters were in public domain after 75 years or 50 years, you would have three Superman movies a year instead of one. Yeah, and, and we would have had to wait, what, 40, 50 years for an Atlas Shrug movie, for example. Oh, and God. Well, I mean, that, that, that might have been for the best. I know, but maybe one a good one would have been made. That's fair, yeah. Um, I've actually got a bunch of blog posts about various uh, uh, comic book trademark and copyright battles, which are crazy. Like you, you probably know some of them, but you know Captain Marvel from DC, right? Who people erroneously call Shazam, right? right. Because he would say Shazam to invoke his powers, um, but 
there was a, a, a there was a gap when they didn't renew their trade. No, so I'll tell the Captain Marvel story. Yeah. So this is so back in the forties, uh, they invented Captain Marvel as a competitor to Superman. He's the yes. guy with the red yeah. clothes and the lightning bolt, and he's a kid, Billy Batson. And yeah. when he says the word Shazam, uh, he gets the wisdom of Solomon, yeah. the strength of Hercules, the power of Atlas, the something of Zeus, so, uh, invulnerability of Achilles, Achilles, and speed of Mercury. Right. right. And then there was Mary Marvel, his sister. Yep. And then there was this crippled boy, uh, Freddie Freeman, yep. who when he, he – instead of saying Shazam, he would say Captain Marvel. He would turn into Captain Marvel Jr. And what's fascinating is that makes him one of the few characters who can't say his own name because when they say <laughs> – when he says Shazam, he turns back. When he says Captain Marvel, he turns back to Freddie Freeman. Um, this character at one point was more popular than Superman. Yep. And they were being published weekly. Uh, his uh, arch enemy is Dr. Savannah, whatever. Mr. Mind, who's this evil worm, is, might be my favorite uh, comic book supervillain of all and time. Black Adam, too, right? Black Adam, yeah. yeah. Uh, which is a very, from the ancient Egypt times. And the Wizard Shazam, at one, his name was Teth Adam. And then there's this very weird panel where the Wizard Shazam goes, I changed your name to Black Adam, and now I banish you. It's like, I don't think that's how names work. Anyway, yeah. um, and Black Adam's going to be played by, is it The Rock? I think maybe the, yeah, I think maybe. the Rock's gonna be playing him in the, in the upcoming Shazam movie. So that was Fawcett Comics, F A W C E T T. Fawcett went out of business. DC bought the rights to all that's the right. Fawcett characters in the interim. Wait, but I believe they went out of business because of a suit, because of a copyright right? Because DC by... was suing them yes. that Shazam, Captain Marvel was a ripoff of Superman, which yes. in a sense it was, yes. but it's not literally the same character. It's inspired by. But again, have... ripoff means stealing, but it's right. not. It's, it's a copy or it's sure. an inspiration. Of... It's clearly inspired by it. Yes, it, no clearly. one would confuse the two. No. There's no confusion. Uh, in the interim, Marvel starts publishing a character named Captain Marvel. Yeah, who, Marvel, I think, at first, right? Uh, may have been. It may have been the short... Well, they changed the alien, Marvel right. later, yeah. And because Marvel had that when the character from Fawcett lapsed, Marvel had the right to call uh, books Captain Marvel. Right. DC could use the character, yep. but they couldn't call the comic book itself Captain Marvel Comics, so they called the comic book Shazam. And now I think they even call the character yes. Shazam because get rid of all these Yeah, headaches. there's a movie coming up. I think they're calling it Shazam. They call him Shazam, yeah. I believe. I yeah. believe. But that's just one example. There's, there's other examples. So it's very Byzantine. There's another and, well, example. Just, let me just say one yeah. more thing with okay. comics because I know people are comic fans. As a result of this, DC especially and other comics keep reissuing yes. comic book series. from Every old, two years or something Every like few that. years yeah. because yeah. even these characters no one cares about, they don't want to lose the copyright on right. them. Yeah, um, I, I, yeah, I've read that too. And then there's some arcane issue with Superboy. Right. Wow, so this is what's fascinating. Okay, so Superman was created in 1935. In 19 early 50s, they started creating uh, in more fun comics. Number 101, uh, they started having Superboy: The Adventures of Superman when he was a boy, and he later created. He later joined the Legion of Superheroes, and he had his own complete different world. He had Lana Lang as his girlfriend. Pete Ross was his best buddy. Uh, he had Beppo the Super Monkey. You know, his parents yeah. were living on a farm in Kansas in Smallville. And so on and so forth, um, and they sue the creators of Simon and Schuster because they said Su Superboy is a different character from Superman, and the argument for that can easily be made yeah. because conceptually, even though it's the same person, uh, you know, like. A, uh, I can't think. Like Eisenhower in World War II yeah. is a very different person than Eisenhower as the president. But Even I think Superboy is actually a different character in some. Versions no. of the comic. He's no. actually not he's not the same. No, he's literally the same because then they had multiple Earths, so there's different planet, you okay. know, parallel yeah. universes. Yeah. The point is it, the whole point is he grows up to be Superman. Then there was a lawsuit, so for a long time, DC couldn't reprint uh, comic books that had Superboy in them, but they could print new issues with a different version of a Superboy character. Right. And now that I think there's like six versions of Superboy. Well, in the Marvel Cinematic Universe, right, there was, there was this complicated thing where Marvel licensed some of its characters to different companies. Like Sony has one and Warner Brothers has another. So that's why it took a while for Spider-Man to be incorporated into the, uh, the Marvel Cinematic Universe. Um, and it's one reason uh, my son even knows a lot about that because he's read more than me, but uh, the Inhumans are, are rising and the mutants are going down because the mutants were licensed to one company oh, and, wow. and the Inhumans weren't. So in the comics, the Inhumans are being played up and there's more Inhumans being created all the time. But they're not mutants, they're Inhumans, right? It's the same idea, but they're trying to get around one of these licensing agreements. And of course, none of this would exist without copyright. This is an – look, in, in my view – if you understand the, just the studies on it and how patent has to limit innovation, uh, I really believe that patent law 
is one of the worst things the government does and probably imposes damage to the human race on the order of a trillion dollars a year in terms of lost wealth because of lost innovation. And of course, that's that's lost lives and lost. Uh, you know, we might have been living in a Judson's world by now if we had been hampering innovation the last 200 centuries. Well, I do have a car that turns into a briefcase. Okay, good. Um, What's the formula? Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> it's the formula, Stefan. Got you by the balls. Um, copyright law, I think, does less tangible damage, but it's it's even worse in a way because it lasts a lot longer. It lasts o- over 100 years now in most cases. Uh, life of the author plus like 70 years. Um and it also gives the government an excuse to limit freedom on the internet in the name of stopping piracy. Okay. And it also heavily distorts culture. What we're talking about is an example of that. It heavily distorts culture. I mean, you were asking earlier, how would do someone do this? Why would someone do that? Um, look, there's industries that are that are not that protected by copyright or patent, like the perfume industry or the fashion industry. I, I know, actually, a, a friend of mine was a project, acquaintance of mine was a Project Runway winner, and she went with Tim Gunn to lobby Congress to have copyright it's, applied to clothing. Yep. And I'm like, this is... Not only is this just completely insane on its face, but how you would apply this when the whole point of fashion is to draw inspiration from other aspects of fashion well, is bizarre. Well, not only that, the high fashion industry benefits from knockoffs because uh, you know a year later, the, the, the high fashion stuff that's uh, from Chanel and these guys, which is extremely expensive, starts appearing at Walmart and you know a, 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 a Target, things like that. So you're a Devil Wears Prada fan. Uh, sure. Well, you know, she gives that whole speech about how innovation happens. Yeah. 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 Um, yes. Yeah. About the colors and the, yeah, you yeah. don't realize Cerulean. how it permeates through culture. Um, but but then you know um, because people can go buy for thirty bucks off the rack somewhere. Um, uh, the the people with money they want something new to show that they have status, and so the the fashion industry can pay their producers to come up with a new thing for the next season. So it actually helps them. It doesn't hurt them at all to be knocked off. Um, but you do. There is one funny thing: is that there's no copyright or patent exactly on fashion, but there is trademark. And so, I believe the reason where like a Louis Vuitton bag or a Chanel bag, they have the big C symbol or the Gucci symbol or the Louis Vuitton logo all over their purses, which is kind of weird if you think about it, right? If you buy a Mercedes car, you don't see the Mercedes emblem all over the car, right? But the reason they do that is because if you make a knockoff of that bag, now you're violating their trademark. So they're trying to hook their designs into trademark. Well, I thought the whole point of that, uh, in all seriousness, is that if you're spe- spending this much money in a bag, those kind of people tend to be ostentatious, and you want to make sure – I want to make sure other people know that I have a Louis Vuitton bag. Yeah, so they're going to have a, the logo on it, but it doesn't have to be plastered all over sure. so so much. They do it so that they can stop uh, uh, trademark, and so then, of course, you'll have uh, – uh, uh, Government officials go down to the docks in Turkey and raid all these, you know, ca- counterfeit shops and burn them in a big thing and make a big, big display of it, like, like a Nazi book burning or something. So, in your world, the model for book publishing would be the publishing houses basically go away, and Kickstarter would be the model for how books are produced. It's hard to predict. I think, I think something would change. I think it would go more like that. And it's hard to imagine what would have happened 50 years ago before we had the technology and the, right. and the internet that we have now that makes that more conceivable. Because but, let's let's let, let me play let me argue for your play angels advocate. I yeah. guess, which is when I'm agreeing with the okay. person I'm talking to, which is right now how it works is I write up a proposal. I shop it around to the six or seven publishing houses. Yes. Uh, my agent sends it to an agent at each house. That agent looks at it, says, you know what? I want to uh, you know, produce this book. He goes to his economic uh, marketing team, whatever the team's called. They, they run the numbers, and they say this, you know, based on their projection of future sales, they say, okay, we're going to offer him you know, $200,000 for this book. Yes. Then, and, and hopefully more than one person's interested, more than one house is interested. And you have a bidding war, yes. and they go back to my agent. Now, what they're basically doing economically is what a Kickstarter would do. They're trying to use the tea leaves to say, okay, this is what we think we can make a safe yes. investment. Whereas here, it's like I am asking individuals yes. to actually make that investment, uh, and I don't have to guess because as long as I have enough of an yes. audience to promote my Kickstarter yeah. or whatever the program is, I will immediately have that cash up front, and I will have. And this is one of the reasons I did my Kickstarter for my book. I, I North Korea because the book was so innovative, patting, patting, my, patting myself on the back, uh, that it's like, is this going to work? So I needed to know that there was enough of an audience to be able to produce it. And at the same time, I'm talking myself into your idea. 
people will want to contribute to a Kickstarter as opposed to editors because you want to be the one who's like, I was there first. I was the yeah. one who saw something special in this project. And you have bragging rights with your friends, which sounds like a joke, but it's not because we all like to be the one who sees the next trend and is actually, in, especially now with the internet culture, who is investing in things to make something special happen. Well, not, you know, not only that, you can make more, I think, per sale as an author if you go more direct like that. I mean, you, you yes, know, that's 100% true. And look, the way I look at it, I've, I've published several books, uh, all nonfiction so far. Um, you know, we all have that novel in us, right? But uh, <laughs> I've got a bunch. Yeah. They're on my hard drive. But m most most I've authors like of, of nonfiction don't make much money. They're Correct. not doing it for money either. They're doing it for reputation or to get an idea out there. If they break even, they're happy, right? Um, yeah, very few books, uh, just statistically, very few books earn back. By earn back meaning it sells enough that your advance right. has been uh, earned. Right, and for fiction... Because an advance... Let me just explain to the to, to readers. An advance is short for advance on sales. Yes. So if you are, let's suppose, earning by your contract with the publisher a dollar per copy and you got a $200,000 advance, the first 200,000 copies that are sold, you're not, up till that yeah. point, you're not getting anything, yeah. which means they're expecting, so very few books reach the point of selling that, in this case, 200,000 copies. Yeah, and same thing with musician, right? A lot of musicians don't make a lot of money, right? They, they make it from concerts, but they, they're making, I mean, you got the big stars that used to make a lot of money, but a lot of people don't make much money. If you remember, you remember Prince had slave shaved into his uh, his beard for a while because he'd been locked into this, con See, the way I look at it was, the printing press. I thought it's because he was talking to Kanye. <laughs> uh, I don't know. I don't think there's a time overlap there, but maybe there is. Um, look, it's Prince. He can travel through time. Um, He's funky. Before the printing press, right? The scribes in the church, the government, they controlled what could be printed. They right. controlled dissemination of ideas to the people. The printing press emerges. The government, the, the church, and the, and the government freak out. So they give a monopoly, like in England, to the stationers' company. It's for like a hundred years they had monopoly over printing. So if you're an author, you had to go through them. You're not doing it for money, but they could control what you're going to say, what the people get to read, etc. When they, when they, when the charter of the stationers' company was going to expire. Um, uh, the government decided instead of renewing it to grant to pass what was called the Statute of Anne in 1709, which is where copyright comes from. So the Statute of Anne gave a copyright to the authors instead of to the publishing house. But as a practical matter, authors still had to go back to the publishing companies. You couldn't publish a book on your own in 1710, right? So you had to go to the publishing companies. So this model arose where the publishing companies, right, the uh, were. were had the control over artists. And the same thing happened later with musicians. And that's lasted until about 20 years ago, let's say, until the internet broke the monopoly. And it was supported by copyright the whole time. And it really wasn't for the benefit of most artists or most authors. So I do think the model would be totally different. Now, I do agree that it's harder to make a profit selling a book if people can knock you off more easily. Yeah. But that's really because of technology, not because of the lack of copyright law. Yeah, copyright law can slow down a little bit piracy, but it's going to happen anyway. Uh, have you been following the Martin Shkreli case? And cause yes. this, this very much applies to what you're yeah. talking about. So I've been following it all uh, because he went after me on Twitter and said I wasn't funny and I should stick to doing what I like. And apparently that's staying <laughs> out of jail, Martin Shkreli. Uh, no, I, I, do you th first of all, do you think he deserves to be in jail? Um, I don't think he's in jail for the patent issue. No, he's not. I'm um, just saying. I didn't follow the other issue with okay. the jail for. Uh, it sounded like some kind of fraud on investors or something. Right. I, I, but I a lot of I times that's that's legal double talk, and I, they just want to lynch somebody. Um, I, so what's talk? About I wouldn't be surprised if he's actually not not guilty of any legitimate right libertarian crime. So what? So. Explain the Martin Shkreli story and, and how this would apply in your. Yeah, but what he was infamous for was he bought the patent rights to. Right, some AIDS drug, life saving. It was okay. You know, some life saving drug, and where only I think only one company had the patent to Correct. it. Correct. Uh, or it, it gets complicated. I actually don't know if that was a patent case. It might have been a case where the drug was patented, but then the patent expired. But then he that the owner of that uh, patent had the maintaining FDA license, which is like a monopoly. So the okay. FDA system acts like a patent license sometimes. Okay. Uh, it was one or the other. I believe he just bought the FDA rights. Okay. And using those FDA rights, which gives you the right to sell something or whatever the free market price will bear, he realized I'm the only manufacturer. He, he raised the price by like 10,000% or something. Right. Uh, and everyone raised a ruckus about it. Right. So, I, I mean, to me, he didn't do anything wrong. <laughs> He's using it. That's like criticizing someone who gets uh, takes welfare. I mean, if, if it's legal to apply for welfare and you qualify and you get a check, I mean, you're just feeding at the trough. So you're saying you can't – don't hate the player, hate the game. Yeah. I think – look, 
if if you could expect people to be moral and to not take advantage of government uh, uh, advantages like this, then you, we wouldn't have any reason to oppose the law in the first place. Like if the government passed a welfare law and no one would take it, we, I wouldn't care. From what I remember, though, he was trying to make the case that by raising the price, he's actually making it more available to people. I don't remember what his logic was. I, I didn't hear. I didn't hear that argument. Um, it was probably some kind of double talk. Okay. Okay, so it was just as simple as rent sneaking. You know, he had a monopoly and he exploited it. I, he he might have been clearing the market. He might have been legitimately realizing that, uh, given the fact that I have a monopoly, I'm the only seller. I, I'm, I'm it's, it's being priced too low. Okay, and most of those well, most of those sales are being done via insurance companies. Anyway. Yes, which is distorted by the government healthcare system in the first place. Right. So this is all intertwined with the government. So. Almost every problem you can point to that you think patents are a solution for, so you, it's a problem caused by the government, and you want the government to come in and add another layer of regulatory controls, a monopoly privilege in terms of patents, to fix the problem. I mean, this is what Mises called the problem of government intervention is that controls breed controls. Once right. you have one control, it causes problems. People try to get around it. You have to have more regulations to stop the people from evading taxes or getting around this. Okay, so uh, we've got a couple more things that I want to cover before we, we wrap up here today. So in uh, I was at the Mises, was it 30th anniversary? Um, 35th? 35th, 35th yeah. dinner. 82 to, yeah. And I came there, and I brought a to toy helicopter. Yes. And I gave it to Hans Hermann Hoppe, and we yes. took a picture together, and yep. he was very delighted. Yep. And there's this got some controversy online. Yeah. Because, first of all, people were, thought, well, Hans Hermann Hoppe doesn't know what this is a reference to. Right. And I, want to, I haven't spoken about this yet, and I'm... I'm telling everyone now. Uh, first of all, he most sure did because Hans Hermann Hoppe handed the helicopter. I go, this is for you. Yeah. And the first thing he says in his German accent is, <laughs> this should have had the Chilean flag. <laughs> so the, what the reference is for people who are not, were not in the know, uh, and I talk about this in my forthcoming book, in the same way that Che Guevara for the left is this symbol that has been divorced from the reality. He's a symbol of hope and you know fighting oppression and all this other stuff, even though he's really just a horrible murderous uh, villain. Uh, in Chile, when Pinochet had a military coup in, what was that, 74? That sounds right. 74. Because, yeah. uh, you know, the communists had taken over, uh, and they were starting to implement all their communist ideas. And it, the thing with the commies is it's not just that they start taking your property. It's that they start having the secret police and start killing people arbitrarily, and, and you have all these sorts of genocides, which are almost, uh, I think, which are actually inevitable uh, and universal. Uh, so Pinochet had a military coup. Uh, he killed, I think, like... 400 people, it's a small number, and he was absolutely a brutal dictator for the entirety of his um, uh, dictatorship. It was a free market dictatorship. You know, this was very odd. Like, he brought in Milton Friedman, guys from Chicago, and he had free market in an authoritarian context. But what he was most famous for, humorously, in, in, on, such on the internet, is he took a bunch of these commies up in helicopters and threw them into the ocean. Uh, so there's you know a little meme that says you can run uh, you can't run you can't hide you will get a helicopter ride uh and very often uh, uh you know hans Hermann hoppe in his book at one point refers to when you have these private anarchist societies the communists will be physically removed uh so these two things conflated to become hoppe flying these helicopters and throwing communists into the ocean so i took a photo with hoppe with the helicopter uh Gave it to him as a present. Then later, you you know took a photo with him with the helicopter and uh, huge meltdown on the internet. Yeah, and l let's just be clear. Uh, so Hans had nothing to do with the, the memes, right? There, there's a couple of meme sites on Facebook where people think it's funny, or they they're fans of some of Hoppe's stuff, or they're or they're or they're trolling. But uh, and I'll I'll just mention this. When I'm on Twitter, and sometimes when a journalist is being so reprehensibly <laughs> egregious i'll just re quote retweet it with a helicopter emoji <laughs> yeah it's become a meme right um and uh and hans is aware of the meme because he, he he reads the internet but i don't he had nothing to do with it right. so when you gave him the helicopter i think he thought it was funny then oh yeah he, he left yeah he saw me you he say hey, look at this picture and then I, I was with hans later hoppa later that night and i said hey let me see the helicopter we did a selfie and i posted it and all these people started saying oh i didn't know kinsella was a closet fascist or you know it's like look we libertarians still hate communists, and you know I'm not saying we should be Pinochet throwing people out of a helicopter, but it's – someone made a meme, and it was kind of funny. It's called having a sense of humor. I got into it with a prominent libertarian whose name I won't mention, uh, who, who like myself is Jewish, and I said, okay, you're Jewish. Um, he's like, yeah. I'm like, do you know any Holocaust jokes? And he's like, of course, because every Jewish person has Holocaust right. jokes because gallows humor uh, and dark humor is very much a part of Jewish culture. Right. Um, and I go – 
are you fine with that? He's like, yeah. And he's like, but I'm not fine with these helicopter jokes because the Nazis are all dead, but this is something that's going on now. So it's like, wait a minute. The bigger concern to America isn't the neo-Nazis. It's the neo-Pinochet people. Yeah, yeah, like, where are these helicopters? I mean, if anything, the libertarians are the ones who are scared the black government helicopters to begin with and the whole, you know, like Alex Jones crew. Yeah, no, I totally agree. So it was one of these crazy, funny, meme, meme type incidents on the internet. But uh, uh, I don't know. Sometimes you say something. If someone just says, hey, you're a fascist, and I've been advocating against all forms of socialism my whole life, what are you supposed to say? I mean, quote me. You find something I did. Well, you took a picture with a plastic helicopter. Which, you're right, which is the universal symbol of It's not the swastika. It's a helicopter. Yeah, which I, which I got. I mean, I think I got the – I asked you where you got it from because I wanted to – wanted Kmart. To, yeah, so I went to Kmart and I got like this toy heli- toy army soldier set yeah. for like seventeen dollars, right? Just to get the helicopter. Yeah, no, seven. It was seven bucks. And yeah, you seven th- bucks. You yeah. throw out the hundred army helicopters. I threw them away. Yeah, yeah put them in the trash, <laughs> and I just had one little helicopter. God forbid we give those 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 toys to children who would need them. I mean, them. <laughs> I guess they're going to boycott Kmart now for selling helicopters. So. We're wrapping, running out of time, but there's something I want to talk about on your personal level. We were getting ready to do the show. I, I was DMing with you, and you just had cancer. Yeah. So what I find fascinating is this is something that a lot of people are going to go through at some point in their life. Yeah. And just the pathos of it. Like how did you find out – and like your dad, you're yeah. married. I mean th- this is just – Let's talk through it. So I think the more people talk about things like this, yeah. the easier it is for people who are going to hear that word. They're not going to have that meltdown, although they will have the meltdown, I'm sure. Well, I can quickly summarize. You, you don't it. have I to mean, be quick. Just so. Well, OK. So uh, about two years ago, I had another health issue, which scared me. Um, but then I kind of got over it. And so now this time my doctor says. Was so, that other issue life threatening or possibly? Yes. Okay. yes. Um, but but that's fine now. You're transitioning. <laughs> I'm going from one to the other. Yeah, <laughs> I, j- I just had my. You know, when you turn 50, you're supposed to take your colonoscopy, right? right. As a, a man or a woman, and uh, I was like, let's have colon cancer now. I mean, I'm, whatever the next thing is, okay. I'm, I'm a guess of that phase of life where things start happening. Right. But my point is, having this first scare, it made me so. Um, you, you know, if you do your annual physicals, your blood work comes in, and you know, you see how much your cholesterol is, and your doctor fusses at you, and all that. And <laughs> <laughs> you're from Louisiana, yeah. So, you, know, so you're, you're gonna, gonna have the high cholesterol. cholesterol. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Crawfish has a lot of uh, cholesterol in it, especially if you suck the heads. Yeah, um, a lot of fat in there. But um, uh, should I? Is that, is that a myth? Isn't eating fat ne- that does not necessarily it's, raise it's your probably, cholesterol? Yeah, it probably doesn't come from that. Although here, shrimp has a lot, but I don't know if the cholesterol comes from eating fat. Right, right. Just yeah. like fat, being fat doesn't come from eating fat. So, right. So I don't know. Uh, doctors still say that though, right? Okay. Yeah, cut down on your cholesterol intake. I'm like, okay. So, um, should I switch to a Louisiana accent? Oh, now, please, no, let's I'm do joking, it. No, joking. I'm serious. Come on, let's do it a little. Well, bit. you go down to the bayou, my chef. <laughs> you go piece the tails of them crawfish and stuck them heads. <laughs> oh my god, that's so racist. Anyway, I've tried all my life to wash that accent, but anyway, no. When I have a when I have a Miller Lite or a, you know, it comes out but, a red stripe. Uh, yeah, red stripe. Yeah. Um, um, now, so my PSA levels is one of the blood tests, and yeah. that's your prostate-specific antigen. That's a, a number that is, is a, a, some antigen produced by your prostate, is, which is a thing men have down around your urethra, right? Which, um, uh, and as you get older, it gets bigger, and so the PSA level goes up naturally over time. But if it goes up too far, it's a warning sign that you might have prostate cancer. Which is fairly common. Yeah. And a lot of men die with prostate cancer, which I've learned in the last uh, – but they don't die from it. Okay. So it's fairly common as you get older. Like if you find out you have prostate cancer when you're 75 or 80, they might tell you, well, unless it's aggressively growing, just – Oh, so this is one of those – so this is actually a, a, in terms of cancers to have, this is one of the good ones because um, it's not going not, to – like, not like pancreatic where a month later you're gone. If you get it when you're – no, it's not, it's not usually fast growing is my understanding. Yeah, okay. I think it can be in some cases. But um, if you're younger like me in my early 50s and you get it – uh, it's more of a concern because it could grow over time, and finally it could spread to the lymph nodes in your pelvis and get bone cancer and all that. So it's it's something you want to watch or do something about. And the typical procedure is what's called a radical prostatectomy. They go in and they remove the prostate. And that everything's y- got to be radical with you. My God, can you be moderate? <laughs> can you be moderate on one thing? I actually didn't do that. Though, so I guess it was anti-radical in this case. Um, and it's it's a routine procedure, but it's fairly horrendous in its complications you can be uh, impotent and incontinent for life oh wow and it's a pretty high percentage of it if my understanding although good doctors say that the risk is pretty low but it's pretty bad even in even the best case you have to have a catheter for like four to six weeks for your urethral group it's pretty horrendous Ooh. but they can cure it okay so it's sort of the the 
the breast cancer for for men okay. except of course it doesn't get the attention of breast cancer to us right <laughs> because we're we're just guys right right, right. we're supposed to be coal miners and die early. and we're gonna yeah we're gonna have to lower yeah. natural lifespan anyway yeah. <laughs> yeah it's a sunk cost yeah. <laughs> um so i found out about this new procedure uh, fairly new it's been around i don't know wait wait so you how did you get diagnosed so uh, so my my urologist said uh, go do a uh, go do a prostate biopsy wait was, is, was he saying he was worried about something yeah, the PSA level was high, so he said you might have prostate cancer. So Wait, we- so I'm sorry. You're going so fast. Okay. To hear a medical professional tell you to your face you might have prostate cancer. Well, he, he, yes. What it's- was your emotional response to that? Well, I thought it was – he said it was a low chance. So okay. I, so at, at the time I was like – so I said I'll get the radical, I'll get I'll get the prostate biopsy, which is they knock you out, they go up your rectum, and they they poke a needle uh, a dozen or so times it's into like a your core prostate, sample. and they take a bunch of core samples, yeah. and then they analyze them and they see if any of them are are, are, are um, cancerous. Okay. So you, were you still were you worried at this point? No. Okay. But then he called me one Wait, day. Did, did you tell your wife? Yeah, she took me because they have to knock you out. Did, I mean, what was her reaction? Just routine. It's, it's a routine follow up of you know, when your PSA goes up, you go. Okay, so she wasn't. Did you tell your son? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. <clears throat> but then the results of the biopsy came back. How much longer? Mm, maybe four or five days. Okay. Were you like antsy the whole time? No. Okay. So, you, okay, you were cool as a cucumber. Yes. Okay. Because I didn't know anything about prostate cancer at the time Got anyway. It. But I, I think I still wouldn't have been too worried. Okay. Because because of my first scare, I'm just not that worried anymore. Okay. So he called me like on a Friday, and he he said, "Look, two of the samples came back cancerous. You have a Gleason score." He did this over the phone. Yeah. He's like, <laughs> well, he said, "You're going to have to come see me next week, and we're going to talk about options." But but, but it's just weird to well, over the phone. He to found be told. out on Friday. He okay. called me on Friday. Okay. So um, I guess that would be better than be like, "Call us, come in next week." I can't tell you why. Well, I think they have a procedure for dealing. He said, "Here's a book, 101 questions on prostate no, cancer." No, he didn't. Yeah, he said, "Go get this book and read it before you come see me." Yeah, I think he was trying to make his. I like. He's like, uh, "I have to see you next week. I can't tell you why." Just as a, for no, a completely unrelated reason, read this book about so you have cancer and are going to die. Well, it's kind of funny. He was like, "Look, don't be too worried about it. Try to have a good weekend." I said, "I'm not worried." <laughs> you really weren't worried? Not, not really. Are you an atheist? Yeah. Okay. I don't think that's why. I'm but, just just curious. Uh, but um, uh, so I read the book, and the book mentioned all these various procedures, which are all horrific. They put radioactive splinters or seeds into mm-hmm. your thing, and he's and uh, but they didn't mention this laser thing, which I'll tell you about in a second, because it was fairly new. So I never would have anyway. So I saw the guy the next week, and we talked, and he gave me options, right? And he and you still weren't upset. Well, I, I started getting upset when I read the book, and I realized what the what like I, I realized that you could probably take it out with this process. So you weren't scared for your life, though, at any point. No, because I figured I could, at the worst case, get the surgery and okay. get it taken out. Okay. But I was very worried about the going through the surgery and the possible consequences. Sure. I mean, you don't want to be incontinent for of life. Of course. Um, and um, so. Then it was time to have my colonoscopy, which I had put off for a couple of years because I had had that other problem. Sure. So I asked my, you know, they go up your rectum again for that, right? And I asked my uh, my 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 urologist, I said, can I have my colonoscopy? Or do I have to wait a while? He says, no, you can have it. I'm like, all right. So I went to see my colon my my GNI doctor for the colonoscopy, right? which came out fine, by the way. So, uh, but when I was in his office, I was leaving, and and he shares a reception room with another doctor, and it's called Prostate Laser Prostate Laser Center. And I'm like, what the hell is that? So I went to the receptionist, and she gave me a brochure, and I went home and read it. And Does it give you, like, electric sperm? <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> uh, anyway, um, and so uh, I watched his website. I had a meeting with him, and I learned about it. And what, what there's about four or five doctors in the U.S. that do this thing. It's called laser, prostate laser surgery. And, and what they do is you instead of getting a prostate biopsy, which is very invasive, I mean, Blood is it pulverizes your prostate. They, you get an MRI in a, in a really advanced MRI machine. It's called a 3T. There's only so many around. They have high resolution, right? And uh, the pro- the MRI looks at your prostate, and they can see the cancer, and they can see where it is, and what the shape is, and how many lesions there are, and things like that. So I did that, and I met this guy, and I decided to do that. What they do is, if you're a candidate, which I was. You, you go into an MRI machine for almost three hours. Oh, my gosh. And, and they put a probe up you, and there's a laser on the tip, and they use the MRI to position the laser exactly next to the lesion, and then they turn it on, and they burn it 
on the inside. Wait, is it going through your urethra or through your colon? No, they go through your rectum, right? Okay, through your rectum, okay. About just a few inches up to the prostate, and they okay. stick. It's just a probe about the size okay. of your finger. Um, and th- there's a little hole in the middle where a little cannular thing is very small. Are you small. awake while this is happening? Or you're, you're awake because oh my yeah, gosh. it's complicated, but I was awake. But I was sedated. I was kind of – it wasn't too horrible. It okay. was painful because they, they have to poke you about a dozen times to find the right spot. Right. And when they do that, they burn it and th- for about five minutes. But then they do that about eight times so they get Can all – Can you smell the burning? No, it's interior. But you could, I mean, the smoke's coming out. Somewhere. No, there's no okay. smoke. It's a laser. It's, it's a laser. It's not. I don't know about lasers in the rectum. Stephon. Okay, so, I'm you know, sorry. it's a fiber optic. <laughs> it's a fiber optic, and it's a bright light. It's a like 15 watt light at the end. It's it's like the little burning area is shaped like a grape. Okay, okay. but it's all on the inside of your okay, body. Okay, you can feel it though. I didn't okay. know you had nerves up in there, but you do. And I was I was, I was like, ah, it's starting to burn. <laughs> he says 30 more seconds, and then he'd do it again. Right. But they're doing this with the MRI on live. It's bizarre. And so at the end, you go meet him, and he shows you, here's the picture, here's before and after, here was your cancer, and now it's gone. Now, my urologist is skeptical because he says, oh, they don't have long-term data because they've only been doing this five years. Wow. And it's not covered by insurance. It's extremely expensive. So, I, I mean, is it six figures? Five, but it's it's up there, you know. Wow. But it's worth it to, to, to me to avoid a lifetime of, you know, of whatever. Of course. But anyway, so, you know, so that's what I went. So uh, as far as I can tell, I'm cancer-free. And I, I walked out the same day. Walked or limped? Well, I I walked. <laughs> I mean, I mean, if you've got burned up your butt, I mean, no, it's it's, I, it's not that bad. Really? Yeah. Wow. Now I had a catheter for a couple of days. Now that's not fun, but it's not as bad as you think. You know what sounding is? Yes. I so I was talking to my. <laughs> yes, I figured out. I found out what sounding is. I could not believe it. Yeah. Some people do this for fun. Yes. This. Yes. I had to learn this on New Year's Day because this is what happens when you have gay friends and they teach you learn terms that you're not supposed to know. Well, okay. So you said you brought it up. So I, I had to have the catheter for two days because I had the surgery in the afternoon. And so usually, they t- anyway, it was only two days, and then I'm back to normal. How how wide is a catheter? Is it like a pen? Oh no, there okay. are big ones. They're different sizes, but I'd say it's a it's. It, it's about the size of the urine stream, roughly. Okay. Okay. So, okay, maybe like the, the lead in a pencil? Bigger? No, no, about the size of your urine. I'd say uh, maybe uh, not a quarter of an inch, but maybe an eighth of an inch. Okay. Or maybe a little bit more than an eighth okay. of an inch. Okay. So wider than that. It actually doesn't hurt. I, I was surprised. It, uh, do we want to get graphic? Yes, we do. Okay. You are welcome. It doesn't hurt that much to go in for the male. But when they go – so they go through the penis and, in, and then they have to go into the, into the bladder. And there's, oh. a, there's a, what they call a sphincter in, that stops your blood. Your, your yeah, 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 yeah. Go through the sphincter can hurt if you tighten up. So that part hurts. It, it's not as terrible as it sounds, really. Yeah, it, it, okay. I, 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 Otherwise, I, some people wouldn't do it for fun. <laughs> wait, so you – I mean they got to lube the hell out of that thing, right? Yeah, it's lube. Well, they, they actually put like this – it's like a toothpaste tube of like super glue, but it's really this numbing benzocaine or something. I don't know what the hell it is. And they, they squirt that into you, and it numbs you up. And that doesn't hurt. I was surprised it didn't hurt. Wait, but – are you continent during these couple of days when you have it in? Or you're just peeing automatically, not thinking about it? You have a bag strapped to your leg, attached to this tube, so... But do you have bladder control? No, because... So the, the catheter goes in, and, and when they go into your bladder, then they inflate this thing, and there's a little balloon that inflates on the inside, about the size of a walnut. Okay. And that's what anchors it in and keeps it from falling out. Okay. And there's on the top of that balloon, there's some openings where the urine goes through. So whenever your bladder gets urine, it just starts trickling out. Do you feel it trickling out? No. You, but you're going to feel the, the bag get you heavier. You feel your bag get heavier. Okay. How often did you open, empty that bag? Isn't urine Every pro- couple of hours. Isn't cause... urine produced in a constant rate pretty much? Pretty much. Did, you, did this discourage you from drinking like any water because you just wanted as less as possible? No, I, I want, no I, I was afraid I would be... I was afraid I would be uh, dehydrated or something. No, uh, I was afraid I would be. Uh, there's a word they use, uh, but it means uh, 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 retention. Okay. And if you have retention, the reason they leave the catheter in for a couple of days after is because, well, the reason for the catheter during the surgery is because the heat of the laser might burn a hole through your urethra. So they're pumping cooling. It's a coolant. That's the reason they do it. So they're cooling your your urethra during the laser surgery. The only other interview where I've discussed urethras this much was with Tom Woods. <laughs> <laughs> I hate to do it, but I just learned about all this myself. But I mean, but... doesn't it hurt more to taking out than putting it in? No. Okay. Because you go into the sphincter to go in, and that hurts. Okay. Taking out didn't hurt. But was it? A, it was a relief. It was a relief. Did you have bladder control back immediately? Yes. Okay. 
which is good. So you probably had pretty much the idea, other than the money that you had to lay out, you pretty much had the ideal cancer experience. Yes, and also my understanding is there's no downside because if it doesn't work, let's say the cancer comes back or it's not really gone, I can still go get the other surgery later. It doesn't. You're just really, out the money. Yeah, you're just out the money. Okay. Wow. Uh, that's so. It was a learn. Now listen, I'm not recommending this because I could be wrong, and maybe my urologist will say I'm crazy. So I'm not giving. I don't want to give medical advice. I do think guys should <clears throat> be aware that MRI. This MRI. And by the way, the MRI thing is becoming. My understanding is that isn't that also a, a patent thing? The MRI machines? I don't know. I'm they sure. must be. Are you kidding? It's well, it's like very expensive. But they're expensive anyway. Um, I mean, it's like I think they, they, I was asking the, the the center where they had this machine. It's like a one point something million dollar. There's machine no and, way that patent is involved with an MRI oh, yeah. machine. Yeah, it's got to be. It's, of course, it's got to be. Um, yeah, of course. And so now there's one there's one good thing in the in 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 the patent statute in the U S. Um, um, there is, I think this was done in the 80s or 90s. Um, uh, there was an exemption made for medical procedure patents. Okay. In other words, doctors can't patent medical procedures. Okay. So they, some doctor couldn't get, couldn't come up with a new way to operate, and then get a patent and prevent other doctors right. from doing it unless they paid him a license. They can't, they can't stop that, which is good. They can patent their little devices, but they can't patent their procedures at least. All right, uh, we are long. Kinsella, thank you so much for swinging by, being my first guest on Gas and talking about uh, patents and urethras, which is going to be a big theme on the show in the coming weeks. I will see you all next week. You are welcome. Oh,